let's now write in all four of those steps. So work one is going to be minus nRT hot, natural logarithm of V2 over V1. To that, I'm going to add the work from step two, which is just N times the molar heat capacity at constant volume, T cold minus T hot. From that, I'm going to subtract the value from step three, which is just nRT cold, natural logarithm of V4 over V3. And then finally, I'm going to add the last step, which is just N times the molar heat capacity at constant volume, times T hot minus T cold. Let's now simplify this expression so that we end up with something that's easily manageable. What we can see if I rearrange this um, expression, I'm just going to group together the work that's done from adiabatic and isothermal processes. So minus nr t hot natural logarithm of v2 over v1 minus nr t cold natural logarithm of v4 over v3 plus n times the molar heat capacity at constant volume, T cold minus T hot. And in this case, what I'm going to do, just to make this simpler in this last step, is that in this final one, if I pull out a minus sign out of this expression right here, then I can write minus N times CVM. And the minus sign that gets pulled out just means that I can reverse the sign or reverse the order of that of what's inside the parentheses. And what we can see here now is that I have an expression where two of these terms cancel each other out. I have NCVM T cold minus T hot minus NCVM minus or T cold minus T hot. So that means the work that's done and the work that's done on the system in the adiabatic steps cancel each other out. And so what we're left with is then the work that's performed in the isothermal expansion and then the work that's done to the system in the isothermal compression. So to simplify this further, we're going to have to do a little bit of work on the side. So I'm going to make this little side box so we can do this little bit of work. But we know that for isothermal expansions, then what we can write is P1V1 is equal to P2V2, and we can write P3V3 is equal to P4V4. And this is the generalized thing because we can apply Boyle's law because we have isothermal expansions, which means that the change, there's no change in temperature. We also found in this lecture that for adiabatic um, changes in pressure and volume, P2V2 times or raised to the power of gamma is equal to P3V3 raised to the power of gamma. And so that became the relationship so that we can then describe as things change between different states for adiabatic um, expansions and compressions, where again this gamma is just going to be equal to the ratio of the heat capacities. We can also write P1V1 raised to the power of gamma is equal to P4V4 raised to the power of gamma. And where I'm getting these expressions from is if I just go back up for one quick sec, we have our isothermal steps, which are up here and down here at the top and the bottom of the pathway. And related to them, we have P1V1 and P2V2 for an isothermal expansion. And we also have P4V4 and P3V3. And so that makes up the isothermal relationships that we can write with Boyle's law. And then we can also, we have our adiabatic um, expansion and compression. And the states that relate those two together are P2V2 and P3V3, as well as P4V4 and P1V1. And so that's basically where I'm getting these values from or these relationships from. It's just basically from that diagram from our curve. In the end, what I want to do is I want to find a way to relate this ratio of V2 over V1 to V4 over V3. Because if I can do that, then that means that I can simplify this expression over here into something that's a little simpler to handle, where I only need to know um, two of the volumes instead of having to know all four of the volumes to be able to um, calculate the total work done by the cycle. And so, as we can see, we're dealing with ratios. So then let's create a ratio of our own. So using the adiabatic parameters, we're going to use, or we're going to create our own ratio. So we're going to write P1 V1 gamma divided by P2 V2 gamma. And that's going to be equal to P4 V4 gamma divided by P3 V3 gamma. And again, all I've written is 
P1, V1 is equal to P4, V4, which is something that we already have just right up here. And we've got P2, V2 raised to the power of gamma is equal to P3, V3 raised to the power of gamma. And that's just what we have right here. And we've just taken the ratio of those two things. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to take out, out of all of these volumes, I'm going to take out just one of them. And what I mean by that is I can write P1, V1 times V1 raised to the gamma minus 1. P2, V2 raised to, or times V2 raised to the power of gamma minus 1. That's equal to P4, V4 times V4 raised to the power of gamma minus 1. P3, V3 times V3 raised to the power of gamma minus 1. And so again, all I'm doing is I'm just taking out a V1, a V2, a V4, and a V3. And what that does to the, all those terms before when I had them raised to the power of gamma is that they're just now raised to the power of gamma minus 1. This is now where I'm going to use Boyle's Law. Because in this case, I know that these bottom terms, or at least on the left-hand side, this P2, V2, well, I know that that's just equal to P1, V1. So I can write P1, V1, v1 raised to the power of gamma minus 1 all over p1 v1 raised or v2 raised to the power of gamma minus 1. And so like I said, I just changed that p2 v2 into a p1 v1. I can do the exact same thing over here, only in this case I'm going to convert the p4 v4 into a p3 v3. So that means on the top I'm going to have a p3 v3 v4 raised to the power of gamma minus 1 divided by p3 v3 v3 raised to the power of gamma minus 1. And now I can cancel out these terms on the left-hand side and the right-hand side. And so what I'm left with then is v1 over v2 raised to the power of gamma minus 1 is equal to v4 over v3 raised to the power of gamma minus 1. And so what this implies is that v1, the ratio of v1 over v2, is equal to the ratio of v4 over v3. Remember that that's exactly what we were looking for back up here, where we were trying to find a relationship between v2 over v1 and v4 over v3 so that we can simplify this expression further. We have that now down here where we can see that the ratio of v4 over v3 is equal to v1 over v2. Or I can use that in the opposite way. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to then substitute this expression that we just determined back into our work expression, where now I can say minus nr t hot natural logarithm of v2 over v1 minus nr t cold natural logarithm of, well, v4 over v3 is equal to v1 over v2. Well, then now since I've got v2 over v1, v1 over v2, I'm going to then flip this v1 over v2, where I'm going to multiply in front of it by negative 1 over negative 1. And what that does is, again, is that I'm going to flip the sign of this negative here, but then that means I can also raise this to the power of negative 1. So let me write that in just a little bit more explicitly so that we can see this. Minus nrt hot natural logarithm of v2 over v1 minus, I've got minus 1 over minus 1, nrt cold, natural logarithm of v1 over v2. So one of these minus 1s cancels out this minus sign, so I get plus, and that one disappears, and I still have a minus 1 that then raises this natural logarithm v1 over v2 to the power of minus 1, minus nrt hot, ln v2 over v1, plus nrt cold, natural logarithm of v2 over v1. What this leaves us in the end is that we can now simplify this expression. We can distribute out certain terms. I can distribute out an n, an r, and a natural logarithm of v2 over v1. And what I'm left with here now is t cold minus t hot. And since we know that t hot is going to be bigger than t cold, then we know that this will give us a negative number when we have a net amount of work that the system performs, which is what we expect from the Carnot cycle, is that we're supposed to be converting heat into usable work. And that's something where the system is transferring that energy to the surroundings, so the total value should be a negative number. 
We also now have this problem that's simplified to that we only need to know now two of the volumes, which basically are related to each other through the isothermal expansion, which is V1 and V2. Once we know those two things, where we know the, the hot temperature and the cold temperature, as well as V2 and V1, then we can calculate the total work from a Carnot cycle.